Okay, Brian, if we were talking about from $100,000 of net worth, excluding home equity, to $500,000 excluding home equity, is like getting close to and reaching the boiling point, then this next strata, I think, is officially in the boiling point. I think yeah. this this is where escape velocity exists for most folks. And this is when your net worth outside of your home is somewhere between 500000 half a million dollars, and then seven-figure land, a million-dollar total net worth. Yeah, and we're, we're being hard on you here. We're, well, we'll tell you. I'll go ahead and share with you. This puts you in the top you know, 21% mm-hmm. of the public. And remember, because we're being so conservative, we're not even counting the home equity. But yep. in a lot of the cases, these people are likely millionaires when they look at their total mm-hmm. net worth. But we're kind of getting excited about the fact that you have at least $500,000 of your army of dollar bills that are now have the potential to work for you harder than you can with your your back, your brain, your hands. So how do we maximize this and make sure that you're doing everything you should? Yeah, one of the things that's so exciting is that the bigger the numbers get, the bigger the numbers get. Let me show you what we mean by that. If you're a 30-year-old and you're saving $10,000 a year and you can make 8% annually on your investments, it'll take you about 20 years to get from zero to $500,000. So you've been working for a long time to get this money moving in that direction, and it is no small feat. But this, again, is where it starts to get exciting. This is where momentum begins to be your friend because what took you 20 years to accomplish in the beginning of your journey, by the time you start closing in on retirement at age 65, in only three and a half years, you can add $500,000. What took 20 years in the beginning only takes three and a half years. Well, think about it. This is the law of numbers. That at sixty-five, this good behavior is rewarded with right under two million dollars. It's mm-hmm. one million nine hundred and eleven thousand yep. dollars. So when you say that, yes, the last fun five hundred thousand dollars took three years, seven months. It's because this thing is cooking. I mean, it, and this is why. It is so slow in the beginning that you'll start doubting, why am I doing this? But if you can just stay the course, you will be rewarded. And then you'll get to the point, and this is why I always say, it's so unfair when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're like, I don't know why I'm going through this, because life is mean. You have the messy middle yep. where you're short on time, you're short on money. But if you stay the course, you're going to get in your 40s. And guys, you're going to live the life you've dreamed of because now your money is going to start doing all that hard work. Your vacations are going to get a little bit better. You're going to be able to make life decisions because you're on your time that much sooner. This is why we stay the course in our 20s and 30s. You still bedazzle your basic life so you're not living a miser life. You're living that financial mutant life. But don't skip this step. So how do we do it? How do we stay the course? How do we begin moving from that $500,000 net worth or wherever we are towards that $1 million net worth. Well, I think the first thing is you have to make an assessment. Am I in the make wealth phase of my journey or am I in the maintain wealth phase of my journey? Because those two phases are very, very different when it comes to wealth building. Well, yeah, you look at risk completely differently. You know, when you're in the make wealth, you obviously should balance the risk reward, Mm -hmm. even when you look at debt payments and so forth, because you're like, hey, what's the incremental decision difference of if I go get this in my 401k versus prepaying my mortgage or other things that are out there? However, once you're in the main maintain wealth stage, this is the part where you say, hey, it's not just about maximizing every dollar that comes into my command. It's also, how do I de-risk my portfolio so that there's nothing that can derail all this hard work, all these assets that have been built up, so I don't make silly decisions or stupid decisions that kind of knock this whole thing away and keep me from staying wealthy. It's not about how much you make. It's about how much you get to keep over the long term. Another thing that you might begin doing in this phase is you might be considering more advanced tax strategies if you've not started that yet. This might be uh, backdoor Roth contributions or maybe some sort of Roth conversions or maybe through your employer you have mega backdoor opportunities or you want to start looking at that after-tax account that's now getting larger. Should I start thinking about capital gain avoidance strategies or should I look at loss harvesting? Are there ways I should do charitable planning with appreciated assets? As your portfolio gets bigger, as the numbers in general get bigger, some of these advanced strategies might be more valuable to you than they may have been 10 years prior in your wealth well, building journey. Well, and this is, this is a good conversation I always have with people is that because when you're talking about the get wealthy versus stay wealthy behaviors, a lot of people who get wealthy 
They did it through risk. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about my entrepreneurs. I think about my real estate investors. They think they're cowboys. I mean, they can handle whatever comes their way. But I always have to have that hard conversation that says, hey, look, you have done a great job of building wealth. But now we have to start thinking about this a little differently. And risk capacity, because I think most people, we think in terms of risk tolerance, Mm -hmm. meaning how much can you emotionally handle before you say uncle and, and, and you actually head for the exits on it. That's what happens when you do your first investment portfolio. You know, the person who's who's helping out with that or you're doing a 401k enrollment meeting. Meeting, they'll talk about risk tolerance. But I tell you, once you get into that maintain or stay wealthy phase, there's a different risk element. It's called risk capacity. And what we mean by that is, is that, yes, you might have the tolerance to ride through any wild thing from an emotional standpoint. However, you might be to the age now that you don't have the time for the money to actually recover. It's easy to talk about recovery in the 20s, 30s, and 40s because you have decades before you actually need these assets to live off of. When you get closer to retirement or actually are in retirement, it might take you six or seven years to recover everything that you might have lost in the next economic downturn. That is a problem, and that's why risk capacity is just as important in your planning as risk tolerance is. Another, this is another fast of that same coin. As you think about risk and the things that could take you off track, as you're moving towards 1 million, one of the things you should do is reconsider your cash position. Am I actually holding enough liquidity so that I can do the things that I want to do? We see far too often folks will get to a million dollars of net worth outside of their home, which is an incredible feat to get to, but they are not liquid at all. Meaning if they want to go buy a new car, they need to replace something at the house, they have to go borrow money to do that. So as you're moving from 500000 to $1 million, you may just want to assess your liquidity needs. Do I have liquid capital available and ready should I need to access it in the near to intermediate term? Um, I'll, I'll be the, the cold water here. Lifestyle creep. No, this is you know, a one. This is one that I think w- I want you to be honest with yourself about your lifestyle inflation. I think it was when you're getting close to this seven-figure mark, um, you're going to start feeling better because you do start to see those quarterly reports where now your assets are moving faster than even your savings mm-hmm. rate. And you'll be like, well, now I can kick it up a notch. And maybe. I, I say, that's why we have the Know Your Number course and other things that we're always trying to educate people. But you've got to do the homework to actually know, are you ahead of the curve on this? Is because what I worry about is people feeling like, hey, I'm at the point where I've built up you know, $600,000 mm-hmm. in assets Maybe I can afford a nicer home. Mm. Yeah, I can move the goalpost again. Easy to justify. Yeah, you can because just because you can doesn't mean you should. I would I would really encourage you spend some time knowing what makes you happy, what makes you tick, even without financial resources involved. Like what do you actually makes you happy, so that you can kind of once you understand that you won't be susceptible to somebody whispering in your ear, "Hey, you you ought to get the super nice car. You ought to get the bigger house." Now maybe some of these luxuries are a good thing for you, but I don't want you to do it. the expense of your future self. So make sure you measure twice, cut once on these big decisions. If I'm hearing you say this, brother, there's nothing wrong with lifestyle creep or lifestyle inflation so long as it's not robbing from your future self. 